Hello, Global Gardeners, and welcome to another Gardening Monday. We're going to answer your gardening questions, share a lot of gardening information, and have a focus today on your garden harvest. Some of you may be thinking it's too early to think about your harvest, but I think that's the wrong way to look at it. Now is exactly the time to start thinking about your harvest, and we'll get much more into that as the day progresses. Shout out to Rick Thalian in Sydney, Australia. It's already after midnight there. And on the other side, we've got Chris Gallero in California, where it's just now 8 a.m., so we're not only watching from all over the world, but actually in two different days, depending on where you are. And I want to say hello to Tran from Vietnam. Tran has been a loyal viewer for a very long time of my videos and always has nice things to say about the information and how nice my garden is looking. So thanks to you, Tran, and nice to see you here as well. Andrew Moon is catching us for the first time live, which is wonderful. I know so many people watch this on replay, which is fantastic. But there's something about being here live with all of you as the conversation is going back and forth that I love every Monday. I know most of you do too. So great to see you here. Let's get right into the initial idea for why I want to talk about this topic today. If you've been gardening for any amount of time, not just new gardeners, but even those of us that have been doing it for a long time, you'll find that too often you get to the summer or the autumn and you have that thought, is this ready to harvest? And then you start, even if you think you know the answer, then you start having doubts as to whether your fruits, your roots, your leaves, are ready to harvest. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've waited too long to harvest. And if you wait too long, the texture is going to be different, the taste is going to be different, and sometimes whatever it is you're growing may not even be usable. I've thrown so much on the compost pile because I missed the ideal harvest time. And the message underlying all of this today for you is plan your harvest long before you get to that point. Plan your harvest before you even put the seed in the ground. You know me. I'm all about planning for your garden, planning for your growing season. Well, as you're choosing your plants, as you're receiving your seeds, start thinking about your plan for the harvest. Some of the harvests may only be a month. You plant radishes in a month, you can harvest radishes. Some of them may be nine months. You put your garlic in the ground in autumn, it's gonna be close to nine months before you harvest. In all cases, if you're growing something with the intent of picking it, pulling it, or just saving whatever fruit falls off of it, you need to have a plan, and I'll give you some tips as we proceed along the lines. Luz is saying, does anybody have a good store suggestion for garden bed fencing, working to keep dogs out of the garden? Um, good point. So I've, I've actually, and you may see, see it in some videos because I'll be putting some fencing around some of my beds because Mal is becoming a little bit too active. It depends on what kind of fencing you want, but I find that the the little welded hoops that you can get in 24 inch heights or 36 inch heights from most big box stores is a, a, a pretty good option relatively inexpensive and i still have the same fencing that i got at least 20 years ago if not more so it can last a long time too comes in different colors it's decorative that's actually what I've used in the past and now we'll be using again to help train and keep the dogs from individual beds. You don't, now your dogs may be bigger and more aggressive, but most of the time, just a simple barrier, just a two foot high fence around your beds is usually enough to keep most dogs out. Even cats, I've, I've been able to keep out of some beds 
with just putting a, a low fencing, but I just go to the big box stores. You can go to the, the, the home centers, branch supply stores. I've done that for the four foot welded wire fencing that comes in the big long rolls. Uh, but it, if you want something a little more decorative for your garden, just, just go to a big box store. That's, that's where I usually go and get a lot of the stuff that I need. Brian, good for you. Ate my last two potatoes last night from last year's harvest. <clears throat> you say bummer, but I say fantastic. To be able to have your potatoes store and last as long as they have, that's fantastic because uh, it'll be time to be planting new potatoes here pretty soon and re repeat that for you. So fantastic. I still have some potatoes uh they're they've they're past the point of eating but i'm saving them because they're at that point that i could use them as seed potatoes so i also have potatoes from uh last season but i'll be planting them i'm i'm, I'm amazed and really impressed that you're able to store them and actually be able to eat them after all this time that's wonderful okay let's see zeke says Five foot welded two by four wire all around my garden. Still get cats inside. <coughs> and so, yeah, if you've got cats that like to use your beds, that's, you're going to have that problem. I have four foot and five foot, depending on where it is in my garden. And the it, it gets to that, that idea that I've shared before. If there is an easier area for these pests to go to, they'll go to an easier area. And so... I've I've seen where the beds that I put a little fence around usually stays pretty protected. If there's another bed that's unfenced or another area that they like to go to as well. But if you just have a problem with cats and they don't have a problem climbing, yeah, those those smaller fences are definitely not going to keep cats out. They'll just bound right over it. And Adin, thank you so much. Thank you for that way to start the Monday. A nice contribution. I appreciate it. Oh, snap. I'm actually out in my garden right now. That's fantastic. I saw a few of the others uh, already comment that they're going to be listening in the garden today. That's fantastic. I'm hoping to get out to the garden here shortly after we finish today because we have a wonderfully warm day forecast. We still have that wind. That's, that's my nemesis this time of year in the garden is the wind. I really don't like gardening in the wind but I don't mind gardening when the temperature is in the 70s range when it's 21 to 25 Celsius in that 70 to 80 degree range and it's windy I can deal with it and that's actually what our forecast is for this week here in my part of Colorado is some very warm days coming with a lot of wind they're usually connected and for the first time this week all of the nights are going to be above freezing. So I'll definitely be out in the garden. I won't be listening to myself, but I'll be listening to music and podcasts to definitely keep keep active in the warmth. Emily's asking, what's a good way to keep deer out of your garden? So same basic idea that we've just been talking about with the cats and the dogs. A barrier is the best way to keep deer out of the garden. Fence the whole garden high enough that the deer can't jump it or at an angle so that their their brain doesn't interpret the size correctly and that'll stay out of the garden that's the best way a barrier that can keep whatever the animal is that you want out of your garden is the best way now there are a lot of other methods and i've got a video actually on how to how to deer proof your garden and some of the methods that i've used so i would suggest take a look at that most of the things that you see, the tricks, you mix up some concoction or you buy something and spray on your plants, they'll work for a brief period. But most animals get used to the smell. There's some crazy aroma when they walk through the first time or two. They're going to go the other direction because it's just too weird. Then they get used to it. Then they come back and say, you know, I don't, I don't like that smell, but I sure like the taste of those tulips. And so the deer will eat your tulips, even if you spray garlic and red pepper and all those other crazy things around the garden. So a lot of methods like that can work temporarily, 
but really for the long term the best way is a barrier a fence or cover your individual plants with netting with hoops with plastic that's often a good way just my simple cattle panel hoops with bird netting or plastic over them that keeps the deer out of each of the individual beds they'll wander through the garden but they won't eat the plants when those individual beds have a cover, cover over them. So it doesn't have to be a fence around the garden, just a barrier, just something to keep them away from the plants. So at Forest Edge, good morning to you. I'm so glad I didn't miss it. Me too. This is such a knowledgeable group with a great attitude. My first garden is coming along. So exciting. Fantastic. I, you know, I, I, I was recently in a, in a video, I was talking about some of my my history and how long I've been gardening and I start thinking about my very first garden and and it goes back almost exactly 35 years in Montana and my kids were very very young I, I was very young and I was equally excited and as I look back I'm excited every year for my garden but I can still remember the excitement of having my own garden in my first house that I bought with my kids and it was it was an exciting time and so I I'm, I'm glad that you're you're staying excited because it, it really is a nice thing to to be new to gardening and have your first garden so good for you and I'm glad you're here Marsha my large compost pile has lots of weeds in it and only part of it has reached a temperature above 150 degrees Fahrenheit how do I re-energize this partially decomposed pile to get it heated up again? So depending on how much organic matter is still in that pile that needs to break down, the best thing to re-energize it is usually oxygen. A pile that's been sitting will, will begin to decompose and then it, it settles. And as it settles, as those decomposed particles be, become smaller and finer, they squeeze out some of the oxygen and with that loss of oxygen the thermophilic bacteria which is what's generating all that heat begin to die off and not repopulate as quickly so often just getting in there and turning the pile and that boost of oxygen can give you an increase in temperatures often in the same day just a few hours it's crazy how fast it works also check the moisture level of the pile too, because if the edges are drying out, and especially if the inner part of the pile is drying out, that will slow that bacterial growth, which will also lower the temperature. If the balance is still good as far as the browns and the greens, the carbons and the nitrogen, usually turning the pile and, and an extra boost of water is, is enough. But if the the materials have already decomposed and what's left behind is bigger chunkier usually dry material then you might want to add a boost of nitrogen and so uh not not sure where you're at but this time in spring for many regions the first time you mow your lawn take those fresh green grass clippings and throw them into a pile that has slowed down and that burst of the green nitrogen is often enough to get your pile kick-started again. Or just pour a, a, a nitrogen source of some time, of some type. I, you, I, you may have seen in a couple of my compost videos, I talk about urine. Urine actually has a pretty good nitrogen source and it's, it's moisture to add to the pile. And so that may be an effective way to get a quick nitrogen boost as well so a couple ideas hope that helps 150 is a really good temperature and and even if it's below that i wouldn't worry too much if you're concerned about uh weed seeds in particular the the most of them will be killed about above 150. if you were able to reach that temperature at some point after a few days of those high temperatures those seeds are are in most cases killed and then when the pile temperature drops those there will still be decomposition going on and and you don't have to worry so much about things being killed because you already achieved that if you did have those earlier high temperatures so i hope that helps get out there and 
Turn that pile. Okay, Russell says, I bought one of those solar sonic repellers to keep a neighborhood cat from using my front yard as a litter box. Cat moved to the backyard. <laughs> I did that with gophers once, and same problem. They, I had a sonic uh, repeller that you bury in the ground, and, and yeah, there were no gophers in that area, but they just moved to other areas. So that's, um, but, but I, I use that to my advantage, actually, and I've mentioned this before in repelling some pests, is just just deter them from the area that is most important to you and you can redirect their activity to someplace else and that's one of the things i talk about in that deer video actually is by planting the the kind of things that that these animals will eat plant those things on the edges of your garden so that they never venture in they just stay happy on the edges and then wander off into some other area because you've got a repeller or you've got a fence or you got a hoop or you've got something that is not as inviting. Entice them to some other area and yeah, that's definitely a, a, a way to deal with it on purpose uh, because most of us do figure that out by accident. Okay, let's see. I'm going to scroll down and see if I can catch something. Samantha's, don't worry about being a few minutes late. You can always catch up. 46 degrees that's about eight degrees celsius no garden time for a while i hope it warms up for you and this last week has really been some cold wintry snowy conditions for a lot of the, the united states and for some of us it's shifting but i know this next week is also bringing particularly in the northern u.s states some more cold and snow but that's that's what we come to expect in springtime for sure. <clears throat> so as you're planning your harvest, I had a video a few months ago where I talked about getting your calendar out and marking on the calendar when you're going to start your seeds, both your indoor seeds and your outdoor seeds. And I do brief mention briefly in that video to write down the harvest time. If you haven't done that yet, that's a very effective way of doing it. When you have your seed packet, it should tell you, most seed packets will, the days to harvest or days to maturing or something along those lines. Note that. So if you put a plant in the ground on June 1st and it says 60 days to harvest, then Get your calendar out and mark down on your calendar to look on August 1st to see if those plants are ready to harvest. Now, that's only part of the picture. That at least gets you in the ballpark. Because where I've had problems over these many years of gardening is I didn't do that. And so I, I forget or didn't pay attention or don't know that a plant is going to need 60 days. And so usually at the 45 day point and the 60 day point and the 80 day point and the 90 day point, I'm still looking at that plant thinking, is it ready to harvest yet? And by then you've missed the ideal time. So that's one quick tip to, to at least get yourself in the ballpark. Now, most of these seed packages and plant tags occasionally will say it, that is a guideline under ideal conditions with a nursery growing in a greenhouse and they take the average of how long it takes for that plant to reach maturity or the days to harvest. Most of us don't have those ideal conditions. So that's why I say if the seed packet says 60 days, begin looking at the plant at that 60 day point. Because if you've had overcast days, if you've had excessive wind or heat, then it might be 70 days or 80 days, but at least you know when to start looking for the harvest. And also understand that that guideline is usually from the point that the plant is growing. So if you put a seed in the ground and that seed has an 80 days to harvest, along with a 10 or 14 day germination time period, then you can expect that that isn't going, that plant isn't going to be ready to harvest until probably 100 days. 
14 days for germination, another week for the plant to actually start growing, and then the clock starts for the days to harvest. And so many of us that are, are growing in short seasons have encountered that problem where I have a 135 day growing season. The seed packet says that a particular melon is a 120 day melon. So you would think I would have a two week grace period, a buffer zone of two weeks. Well, it takes about two weeks for that melon to germinate and begin growing and become a plant and then 120 days I'm going to get a melon. And that's why some of us never have success growing some of those kind of plants in our garden because we don't take into account that the germination time isn't always included. There are a few seed companies out there that will say 100 days from when you sow the seed, but those are very, very few companies that are doing that. Most of the time they're expecting that you're going to be putting a transplant in the garden. And so the clock starts when that plant, that transplant is placed into the garden. And again, if it's ideal conditions. So that's a guideline for when you can begin looking to begin your harvest. Recognize, and this is the fun part about gardening, what kind of plants you're growing. And as you learn more about those plants, you'll learn that for some of these crops we're growing, that clock really doesn't make that big a difference. That clock is the days to maturity. That's when the plant and the fruit or the root or the leaf is going to be at its peak, but you may be able to harvest sooner than that. Spinach, you probably bought baby spinach at the store. Spinach can be eaten at any phase of its growth. So if you like small spinach leaves, harvest it early. If you like big spinach leaves, harvest it late. At any point you can harvest the spinach. And so the guidance on the seed packet is a guideline, but not something that you need to hold yourself to. A lot of root vegetables are the same way. You can harvest a carrot at any point and it's going to taste like a carrot. It's going to be very small and skinny and not much to eat when it's only a month old, but it's going to be nice and big and robust if you wait two or three months. At any point, you can eat the root. Beets, another great example. You can harvest beets when they're still very small. They'll be tender and sweet, or you can wait until they reach maturity and you're going to get a full size beet root at that point. By learning about the plant using beet root as an example, we might be growing it for the root, but the leaves are completely edible too. So you can periodically harvest some leaves of your beet root plant and then when the root is ready to harvest, you pull the whole thing up and you eat the tops for one dish and you eat the beetroot for a different dish. So you can see how it gets crazy and why so many people have so many questions about harvesting and why it's often a problem because there isn't a single answer that just says every plant harvest at the 45 day point. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Instead, we have to learn about our individual plants and why we're growing them to determine best what we're looking for and why we're trying to do it. Okay, let's see, Sandy Lee says, can you use clean horse bedding as a mulch the same way you would straw? Uh, yes, you can. I would say, however, the, you know, assuming that the, the horse bedding has some manure in it and some urine in it, I would, Put that, that bedding off to the side and let it sit for a few months before I use it as mulch. There is the problem that with manures, particularly horse manures, that you could have uh, contamination like E. coli, for instance. And so if you use a bedding like that in your garden fresh, you might be introducing some uh, pathogens or some bacteria that you really don't want around your food crops. 
Now, I'll use relatively fresh horse bedding from, uh, you know, raking out the stall around my, my fruit trees and around my fruit bushes. I've done that a lot as a mulch because I'm not worried about that, that contamination with, with E. coli or, or any of the other um, things that you don't want on your food because none of that tree or bush is going to be touching that mulch, at least the, the flowers and the fruiting part. So in your vegetable garden, I would ideally compost it because in many cases it's great for adding to a compost pile. But if you're not going to compost it, let it sit for a while. <coughs> Six months is really a good target if there's any fresh manure in it. If if you've got the kind of horse that that is outside most of the time and the bedding is just for sleeping, it's not as big an issue. It's, it's, it's mostly if there's manures or that kind of waste in it that I would be concerned. But uh, yeah, reuse all of that straw and uh, in any way you can in the garden. That's always a good idea. Okay, PD is saying, I have a spreadsheet with all the data of the seeds I want to start both in and outdoors. I back up the germination dates from the date I expect to start it. It helps me as the season starts and progresses. Great idea. That's, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Really good tip. Thanks for that. Uh, let's see. Scrolling down again. Soil <coughs> and margaritas. I like that idea. Do you have some advice for someone using grow bags for the first time in their veggie gardens? And so I do have some videos on grow bags. Last year I grew most of my potatoes in grow bags. The year before I grew a lot of peppers and tomatoes in grow bags. Think of a grow bag as just a small raised bed. And you can grow just about anything you want to grow in it. I'm planning to, to do some carrots in grow bags this year in addition to some of the salad crops. The, the soil is something that... In, in all cases in gardening, you have to think about the soil, but particularly in a grow bag, you're going to be filling it with something. Make that something as good as you can. So a, a nice uh, amended mix. There, are, uh, Most of the, the potting mixes that you'll find should be okay. You don't really need to mix garden soil into a grow bag. You can just use potting mix. Fertilizer is important because most mixes, unless they have worm castings and, and fertilizer and all the nutrients in it, the plants aren't going to do as well. So do look for a mix that has some slow release fertilizer in it or be prepared to add your own. They, they dry out faster than a typical raised bed and definitely faster than an in-ground bed. So still mulch in grow bags. That's often forgotten. People think in terms of mulching their garden beds, but they don't mulch their grow bags. Go ahead and put some dried grass or straw in your grow bag. That'll help keep the soil moist for a longer period of time as well. But anticipate that you may need to water every single day. I know in my region, as dry as it is, I have to add at least some water to my grow bags every single day. And you'll have to figure out, you know, do, do a, a moisture check with your finger just to see how moist the grow bag is, is staying. Because the other part of it is the assumption that is going to dry out means that Many people overwater their any containers that they're they're growing in. So do a physical check to make sure the soil moisture is okay. And a wonderful thing about grow bags is you can move them. So over the course of the season, you can move them into more sun, less sun. At the end of the season, you can move them indoors if it gets too cold. So anticipate that as well. Don't think that a grow bag is in its permanent location when you place it on the ground. It's portable and take advantage of that. So, uh, hope that helps and check out some of those videos if, if you want some more information about that. Shannon's asking, are your bags of soils and compost looking different this year? Mine are different. They are more full of cocoa core, much drier. I still soak with diluted fertilizer. And so um, I have noticed that that the stores are selling more products with cocoa core versus the peat moss. And so 
Uh, mine, since I make my mixes for the most part myself, I, I haven't seen any bags that I'm getting. Um, though, that being said, I just bought a couple bags this week. I'll be buying some more this next week because I'm going to be doing a test this year to compare different potting mixes versus my own and see if I can see a difference in how the plants grow. So I, I haven't opened those bags yet to, to see if there's a difference in color. But the Coco Core is a lighter color than the peat moss. And so that, that would definitely explain why the, uh, the bags of the potting mix look different because it is a different product. And yes, you will need to, to soak that potting mix so that it gets nice and moist. And there's no nutrition in either peat moss or coco core. So fertilizer is definitely a consideration that you'll have to keep in mind. Urban Chicken Mama, my girlfriend gave me a ton of seeds this weekend. Guess I'm growing turnips, even though they aren't my favorite. I'll just give them away or give them to the chickens. Turnips is another plant that you can eat the leaves. Turnip greens is a classic Southern dish. And so uh, the, the I experimented a little bit this last year and I'll be doing more this year. Pickled turnips are actually, I think, pretty good. I, I have a video in, uh, on pickled beets. I like to, to pickle my beets. Fermenting them is my preferred method. But I'll be doing the same thing with turnips this year because I love roasted turnips. Roasted turnips, roasted beets, roasted potatoes all together. I just love that. It's one of my, my favorite side dishes along or to have along with dinner. Turnips by themselves, I don't eat a lot of. But think about doing some pickling or fermenting of those turnips and uh, and see if maybe you'll discover a different way to use them that, that you hadn't tried before. And, and then if you don't, go ahead and throw them to the chickens. <laughs> the chickens will definitely enjoy it. Terry's asking, is using pine shavings okay on top of my soil to keep the soil moist like mulch? Yeah, absolutely. Now, again, I use different mulches in different areas of the garden. And so pine shavings, while while typically thinner than like a, a pine wood chip mulch, will still take longer to decompose and break down on top of the soil than something like straw or dried grass. So do be aware that when you use it as a mulch, it's not going to, to, to break down quickly at all. And, and you'll have it for the next year in many cases, and maybe even the year after that, depending on how wet your climate is. And so in the vegetable garden, I, I hesitate to use those kind of mulches just because of how I garden. I'm amending my soil, I'm adding compost, I'm turning it over, and if I use something like pine shavings as a mulch in my vegetable garden, whenever I transplant, whenever I turn over the soil, then those pine shavings will get into the soil and possibly cause a temporary depletion in soil nitrogen because those shavings need nitrogen to decompose. And that could take nitrogen away from plants that would be growing in that same bed. If you're raking aside those kind of mulches to transplant and then cover back up again, it's not that big an issue. Just be aware of how you garden and whether those pine shaving uh, pieces are going to get into the soil or stay on top of the soil. But perfectly good mulch, yeah, absolutely. Uh, those are the kind of mulches I tend to use around my strawberries, my asparagus, my raspberries, the, the perennial plants that I'm not going to be turning over the, the soil on a regular basis. And so I can put those kind of mulches in place. And actually a pine shaving mulch on something like asparagus uh, it will actually be pretty good because it will break down over time and add some nutrients from the top down, which is... Always a nice way that I, I like to garden. Jean-Pierre, nice to see you again. I have these year only access to horse manure as a brown material and I should use it as an amendment, but the horse ate salt. Does it help when it leached out for a certain time? Yes, so um, you, you, I'm sure you, you remember me talking about this in the past. That, that's one of the biggest issues with horse manure in particular. If they had a salt lick, then that salt gets into the manure. And 
and I think I've told this story a couple of times at least, at the Galileo School Garden when we had a donation of tons of, of steer manure and horse manure and cow manure mixed, but most of it was the steer manure. It was loaded with salt to the point that we had a, a test done on it and it was hazardous to plants. So we just left it in a big pile, let the rains fall on it, and after about four or five months, there was a noticeable like four, five inch layer of salt at the bottom of the pile. And so the bulk of it had leached out in that four to five month period. And then we began using it in the garden and didn't have any problems after that point. So yes, you can use it. You can expect that 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 salt will leach out you you can accelerate it we just let it sit out and just got the natural rain if you put it into an area of your garden and you regularly water it like every day or every other day when you're watering your garden you water that pile of manure it will leach faster and so can't give you an exact time but i'm sure you could cut it down in half and so pile up your manure water it every couple days and you might be able to use it after just two months uh, but but be aware that it, it will take some time even in that short two-month period or a longer four-month period and so i'm glad you're thinking about that because uh, you definitely don't want to use a free material like horse manure and then end up finding that it kills all of your plants but that's a bad thing so Jay Dixon, always nice to have Jay and Heidi here helping out every week. Uh, humanure, best for ornamental gardens as a non-food. Yeah, exactly. So humanure is being marketed in, in a number of areas, and it's human manure. And same basic idea. There's the possibility of some pathogens and E. coli, and, and so they sell it with the intent that it be used in an ornamental area around trees and not in the vegetable garden for the same reasons that I talked earlier about fresh manure. So thanks for that link because uh, it's actually becoming more prevalent in, in different areas, at least of the United States. So I think that's fantastic. Shannon says, I woke up with snow on my opened winter jugs and I'm concerned. I wouldn't be too concerned about it. One of the um, one of the things about the winter sowing, and so I did a video a whole year ago about using jugs, putting the seeds in it, put it outside in the winter, and then leave it there to germinate. And so depending on what seeds you, you sowed in those jugs, they're not going to germinate and start growing until the soil is warm enough, the day length is long enough, the moisture level is, is high enough, and and so snow is usually not that big an issue. Now, if you had something like peppers or, or tomatoes and they had already started sprouting, that's a whole nother issue. That's saying that it's too cold and those plants are, are probably not going to, to survive. But if you're doing flowers or cool season plants that hadn't germinated yet, I don't think it's, it's that big an issue. Snow, the, the temperature of snow is right at freezing. And my guess here is that your nighttime air temperatures have been colder than that. And so the snow may actually be warmer than some of the conditions that, that those jugs may have been exposed to. So um, concern is okay. Um, I wouldn't be worried. Just keep an eye on it. Try to see if any of those plants have sprouted. Uh, we, we don't have any snow in our forecast, but knowing my Colorado weather, we have at least one more snowstorm coming. And this is the week that I've started sowing seeds in my garden. The turnips and the beets and the lettuce and the spinach and the chard. And I'm not that concerned about those seeds at all, even when we get that snow, because those plants can handle it. So it, it, it all does come down to the kind of plants that you're growing and, and most cases it's not an issue because they're not going to naturally germinate if it's too cold out. 
and and then suddenly they will one day everything will start growing because the conditions are right for those plants and and that holds true also with the whole harvest idea remember when i said that the ideal conditions are how they determine the time to harvest or days to harvest or days to maturity and so if you have those cold days like the, the the snow on the beets or the turnips that's going to slow down the plant and the harvest is going to be pushed out beyond an expected time period even heat can cause stress on a plant so at the peak of summer if you have exceptionally hot days and especially for regions like mine where it's not only hot but it's windy and that tends to dry out the plant well, the plant is shutting down during the day. It's, it's, it's closing off its, its transpiration, and it's just waiting until the conditions cool to begin growing again. That will also spread out the, the expected time to harvest. And so anticipate that. You, you've, you've got your guideline on the calendar of when to start looking for the harvest. But realize that, that the individual days that led up to that point do make a difference and sometimes you can control that by putting shade cloth over the plants on those exceptionally hot days or trying to put some barrier up to keep the dry wind out that can make a difference if you've done everything right and it seems like your plant is taking a long time to be ready to harvest it could be the weather that happened two months earlier that you hadn't even thought about. Another reason for uh, having your garden journal and keeping track of weather conditions, because you may be able to see those kind of correlations on those specific plants that aren't doing as well as they have in the past. Go back and look at your journal and you may see the weird weather that you had and and, and you can get really crazy with this creating the data, but you may notice in certain years with really hot temperatures over a prolonged period of time, let's say you have a, a, a week with the temperatures above 100 degrees, about 38 Celsius, then when it comes to harvest, you're noticing that your harvest is a week late. Well, I would draw a direct correlation to that and you might be able to plan for that in the future when you start seeing some of those weather patterns repeat it might give you an idea to go to your calendar and slide your harvest date by a week because your experience has shown that that's the result of some of these weird weather conditions that so many of us are getting these days so jay's saying my turnips get eaten by bugs how to see which bugs and how to treat and so um the that I actually use turnips as one of my magnet plants, my sacrificial plants, because my turnips get eaten by my bugs as well. Recognize first off that if you're growing the plant for the root, it doesn't matter how much the leaves are eaten. And so I personally am not a big fan of the turnip greens to eat. And I don't mind that the bugs are eating the leaves knowing that I can still harvest that root. And while they're eating my turnip leaves, they're leaving a lot of my other plants alone. Now, if you wanna eat the turnip greens and the, the holes are a problem for you, then yes, identifying the, the specific pest and figuring out the best way to control it is good. And so you, you probably remember, Jay, I think you, you gave a link to it or, or at least we talked about it, the iNaturalist app on a phone can be a good way to identify bugs and other pests in the garden. So I, the letter I, Naturalist, check that out and that, that'll that at least identify the bug. And then once you know what the bug is, then you can figure out the treatment. I, I still like sticky traps in my garden as a primary way to deal with a lot of the insects I have um, just to avoid spraying or doing any of those other things that, that could potentially be a problem. So, okay, let's see, Colorado Bird Nerd, 
always nice to have you here on Mondays. Thanks that for that contribution. I have a small 8x8 eight eight raised bed garden that I wasn't able to clean up last fall. Is it too late to chop and drop and mix into soil or do I need to compost? Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say it's too late. Here in Colorado, we are about six weeks away from most of what we're going to be actively growing. So I'm six weeks away from my peppers and tomatoes and squashes and melons and pumpkins and all that kind of stuff. And so for those kind of beds, I don't think it's too late. Go ahead and chop and drop and turn the soil and add compost. And in that six weeks between now and then, that material should begin to decompose. Any nitrogen depletion is just going to be temporary and should recover after that the decomposition of that organic matter and after the soil life springs to action with the warmer temperatures that we're all starting to have. If you're wanting to grow the cool season plants, the turnips and the beets and the spinach, all those kind of things, I... I wouldn't necessarily incorporate that into the soil. I would probably go with just compost or, or, or decomposed organic matter so that I don't have that, that nitrogen depletion. It's not as big a problem with the root vegetables because they don't like a high nitrogen environment to start with. We're growing them for the roots. But typically in spring, I do not turn in the material into the soil, that organic material if I'm going to be starting seeds or planting within just a couple weeks. But if I've got four to six weeks, yeah, yeah, I, I don't see a problem turning it in and uh, mixing it into the soil. Uh, another good way to just add organics and keep your soil amended and, and provide all that wonderful food for those soil organisms. Blue Roses, Diane, good morning to you and everybody else as well. That's a nice cheery smiley comment i appreciate that thanks uh let's see scrolling down shandy's garden you are awesome and you make us awesome even if i'm having technical issues thanks shandy's garden i appreciate that that's that's uh, anytime anyone calls you awesome what else can you do than smile and say thanks so uh, i appreciate that and yes i am trying to make you all awesome because you are awesome Gardeners are just awesome. That's that's not the first time I've said that. So uh, that's fantastic. Uh, Lynn's Retort, do you have recommendations for things to have on hand for unpredictable weather? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I, I have a few videos where I talk about the, the weather and, and how to protect your plants. Uh, one I did a couple years ago was focused primarily on cold, but I also do address uh, things like, like hail and wind. And so what I do is I have pre-cut material on hand. I have plastic sheets that are already cut to the size of my beds. I have shade cloth that's already cut to the size of my beds. I have hail cloth that's already cut to cover my beds. And so, yes, I do have all of that material in place. I also have... Uh, a, a row cover fabric. It's not fleece, but it, but it's similar to cover my beds. And so I I like to have my cattle panel hoops. Oh, and and you may have seen those in the background in some of my videos, or I showed how I made them in some of my videos as well. I like to keep my hoops on my beds through most of the growing season, depending on what plants I'm growing. And then if the weather is going to be a factor. I'm always looking at the forecast, I can pull out one of those pre-cut sheets. And I use spring clamps. Those are the kind of clamps that you just squeeze and, and they'll lock into position. And so I've got a box of spring clamps in my shed. So if there's cold weather coming, I just grab the plastic sheets, throw them over my hoops, and clamp them in place. If there's hail coming, I'll put the, the shade cloth or the hail cloth or the plastic because they all work pretty well against the hail and clamp them to those hoops as well. So, uh, yeah, there's there's some some items that uh, that you can think about depending on what you're trying to protect against. Go ahead and have that material ready to go. My beds are four feet wide by eight feet long and my hoops 
are about two feet tall. And so I need a sheet of plastic that is 12 feet long to completely cover my bed. It's, it's got to be two feet on one end to be able to cover the end of the hoop, and then eight feet of the length of the bed, and then two feet for the other part of the bed. So all of, most of those pre-cut pieces are 12 feet long, and they're between six and eight feet wide, and that's enough for me and my hoops and my beds to completely cover it. So go ahead and if, if you're putting hoops in your beds, measure exactly what size those, those sheets need to be, and then pre-cut them and put them in a nice easy, uh, or easy uh, location accessible, and that should help out. So um, those are those are definitely things to do. I, I don't have as much row cover. I'm actually I need to get some more um, because I, I really like using the row cover fabric in spring to keep insects off the plants that might eat the plants in particular. And uh, also they add a little bit of warmth in my cold environment. So uh, you can get double duty with a lot of this material. They can warm up the plants in spring and then also protect from weather at other times of year. So there you have it. Chris, thanks so much. That's a fantastic contribution. I really appreciate that. Thank you for that donation. So glad you're you're here today and joining us. And um, Dillon Beach, California is where you said you were from earlier today. So thanks for spending your Monday morning with us. And uh, glad you can be part of the group. Greg Daner is saying, thinking about trap crops, is there any concern about planting trap crops for the bad bugs to congregate on? Will just lead to more bugs overall as they reproduce. No, in fact, that's actually what I'm talking about. That's that's specifically the idea. First off, they're congregating on those plants because they're weakening those plants. The plant is sending off all those chemical signals that says it's being attacked. It's drawing more insects. And yes, it will attract more insects, but it will be attracting insects to that weakened plant or however many plants they're infected. But kind of back to, to Jay's point, once you identify the pest, then you can begin controlling it. So if you've got, uh, let's say a, a pirate bug and you don't want pirate bugs in your garden and you, you see them everywhere in your garden, how great would it be if you could get all of those insects to congregate? Now you can throw a plastic bag around the plant and shake it and they all fall in the plastic bag. Or you can put sticky traps around that plant or you can cover that plant with neem oil or you can put BT on it. Whatever that particular insect is and you know of a treatment for it, it's easier to deal with that on a congregation of insects. When we had a huge infestation of harlequin bugs at the Galileo School Garden, that's exactly what, what we did and how we dealt with it, is we had seen harlequin bugs in a number of areas. They loved the turnips. And once they began eating the turnips, they were nowhere else in the garden. They were only on those turnips. And so we'd come out and I'd get four or five students and we'd have our plastic bags and we would just pluck off the harlequin bugs and drop them into the plastic bags because all of the harlequin bugs were in that bed. And after doing that, getting all those adults before they could lay eggs and then keeping an eye out for the future, the next couple of years, we didn't have harlequin bugs because we were able to deal with them in that one place pretty effectively so um no i i'm not i'm not that concerned about it at all in fact ideally that's what's going to happen is you can you can corral them into an area where you can you can deal the death blow so to speak because they have all congregated so uh i i and turnips or something about turnips that just is so enticing to so many of those kind of pests that that's one reason why I grow turnips every year. Shandy's Garden, thanks for that super sticker. I really appreciate it. Always nice to have you here on Mondays. Wink Tartanbell, 
from North Texas. Hard pan, clay, native soil, I feel for you. So using raised beds and chicken bedding and poop, good. Native soil with cover crops and broad fork, great. Even tillage radishes have it hard here, suggestions. And so uh, soil amendments, the, the compost, the looser you can get your soil in those raised beds, that's uh, that's the goal. That's what you should you should be striving for. So the compost, the crushed leaves, the, the dried grass, all that stuff that you can add to the soil at the different times of year. In your raised beds, keep doing that. Try to make it as rich and loose as possible. But particularly in Texas and in, in North Texas in particular, you get those hot days with those drying winds. And, you know, I've, I've driven through Amarillo so many times and, and, and almost been blown over on the highway because those winds can be so strong. Start thinking about protecting your plants. Maybe, maybe grow trees or shrubs or hedges to break that wind. Or, and, and this is what I do here in Colorado because it, we often get the same wind, is to put your hoops over and kind of like we we're talking about before, covering wind is a weather component that can damage plants. And so I, I use the, the row fabric, that light material over my hoops it also cuts down on the wind. And so think about that aspect as well. If you can use a material to cut down on the wind, to cut down on that harsh sun, and then you have a good soil that you can keep evenly moist, I bet you'll see that you'll have more success. It's, it's just recognizing how the weather impacts our plants and then dealing with the weather that is, that is really the, the key component and, and hoops, and some type of cover is just one of those magic things that we can do in our garden that, that really has a huge impact. And uh, I, I found, so, so Mala is really good. Mala, my garden dog. When we're out in the garden, she walks along with me. She often just lies down and she has a couple spots where she can lie down and watch me as I'm working in the garden. And I, I work with her to not get on the beds or walk across the beds unless I'm making a video and and it's all part of the plan and I I I call her to me so it's part of the video but generally it's not allowed last night it was time to go to bed she went out later than normal I went to see what she was doing and she was sleeping on one of my raised beds underneath the moonlight first time I've seen that First thing I thought about was I need to make sure I put my hoops over my beds today or at least before I get all of my seeds in the ground because my lovable dog has found a nice warm spot to have a nighttime nap. Hoops can solve that problem in addition to all the other weather issues that they can solve. So I love hoops and and highly recommend them. And I have enough hoops for all my vegetable garden. And, and that's part of the plan as well. If I add more beds, then I'll add more hoops to cover those beds just because they are so effective. I don't, you don't see them as much in some of my videos because I, I make a video to show something and sometimes the hoop might get in the way. But if I'm not making a video about a particular plant, or bed, they've got hoops on them. And uh, I, I, I strongly encourage that. That's one of those secrets of gardening that once you once you find a way to use it to your advantage, you'll keep doing it. Urban Chicken Mom is asking where I buy my shade cloth. It's expensive in Seattle and used old white sheets. Old white sheets will work. <clears throat> and so I get, I get most of my coverings because I have a bigger garden and because I buy in bulk at a website called greenhousemegastore.com. One word, Greenhouse Mega Store. And you can buy in bulk, nothing fancy, at, at cheaper cost than what I see at the nursery or the box stores. And so that's where I tend to buy. Like everything, the prices have gone up in the last couple of years, um, but it's still a relatively 
uh, inexpensive way to, to buy material in bulk. And so I think I bought a roll of the shade cloth. Uh, let's see, it was seven feet wide. And I think, and you can order whatever width and whatever length you want. I think I got it seven feet wide with a roll that was like 70 feet long so that I'd have enough for uh, to, to cut into the, the individual coverings for my bed. So so check out Greenhouse Mega Store, compare their prices and decide what you need and you might be able to, to save some money along the way. So, okay, I'm scrolling down. I, I missed some of the, the stuff that was going on. Yogi Lai, thank you so much for that super sticker. I appreciate the, the contribution. It's always nice to, to see the participation, and thanks for being here on a Monday. Marsha Davenport, hello. I'm using cattle panels to cover my crops, as you suggested. Could you please add a link to the spring clamps that you use with different covers? Sure, so I'll go ahead and I'll add a link to, to that and some of the other stuff we're talking about in the description to this video. And so um, look for that. It'll take me a couple hours or so to probably get to that after I do my normal morning recovery and out to the garden and check on Mala and play with her. She always wants to play as soon as I'm done. Um, but yeah, look for that in a couple hours and I'll put the link in the description uh, below. And uh, you, can, you can check that out. I'll also put a link to the Greenhouse Mega Store so you can copy that. I don't have any a partnership or any affiliation with Greenhouse Megastore. They're just the ones that, that I've found do the best. And I just got a shipment from them. The um, I got some six foot bamboo and uh, I got some, some other um, growing supplies. I look for their, their sales. They usually have, uh, if you order more than $99, it's free shipping in the US. They recently had uh, $49. If you order $49, it was free shipping. So, so they have periodically those kind of, of, of sales in addition to reduced prices at different times of year for different products. So I usually look for the sales. I think their prices are good to start with, but then if you can throw a sale on top of it, uh, that's, that's definitely something to take advantage of. But the spring clamps I, I get from Amazon. So I'll put a, a link to the spring clamps in, in the same description below. Uh, and, and also, you know, that's one of those things. Uh, you can find spring clamps at the big box stores. But the last time I went into, I think it was Home Depot, and I, I just needed a couple extra spring clamps. And I was there, and I asked the guy where the spring clamps were. And he had no idea what I was talking about. So I had to find the spring clamps myself and then show him what they were and where they were. So that's one reason why I just go ahead and get them from Amazon because I'm finding a lot of the help at some of the stores aren't as helpful as they used to be, at least when it comes to spring clamps. And you can get them in all kinds of different sizes. And, and uh, again, I buy a box of them on Amazon and, and I'll put that, that link below. Terry, thank you so much for that. I appreciate that as well. Thank you. Nice to have you here and participating. And it's so nice to see everybody participating with all the stuff going back and forth. You guys really are just a fantastic group. Chandy's Garden says, the longest side of my yard is south facing and I have my cedar fence. So I get three feet of shade cast most of the day. I want a really long bed there. Will asparagus thrive in 80% shade? So um, yes and no. Thrive is a relative word. And so the, the asparagus is going to start uh, appearing in spring. For some of you, it probably already has. Mine hasn't yet. The ground is still too cold. But any day now, especially with this next week, I'm guessing in a week, my asparagus is probably going to start emerging. And so it's used to growing in cooler conditions in spring, and it doesn't need as much light in spring for you to get the asparagus spears growing. But you should always keep at least a third, at least, in my opinion, half 
of each year's spears growing to develop into the big tall fronds of leaves that asparagus will become. That's the critical time. And so those fronds are most actively growing in the middle of summer. And so I'm guessing once the sun reaches its height, that three feet of shade that you might have right now may only be six or eight inches of shade, depending on just exactly uh, where you're at and how high the sun is going to be, get. And so if you allow those asparagus plants to grow three or four feet tall, which is normal for them, and at the peak of photosynthesis, they're getting full sun, then they should thrive. Because as the shade will reappear in late summer, those fronds will start browning and dying back. So it's that critical point of summer of photosynthesis that sends all the energy into the roots for the spears to develop the next year. And as long as you're getting sun during that critical time, then you, you can probably grow asparagus there and they'll probably do fine. I would consider, go ahead and, and do a, a, uh, a analysis. I, I, I have a video where I talk about making a sun chart and, and you do a map of your garden with the sun and the shade, I would say this year, go ahead and, and look at that if you haven't put the asparagus in yet. If, if you have ordered the asparagus and it's coming, you can go ahead and try it in that area. But if you're not gonna do it till next year, go ahead and map out the shade along that fence and that'll help give you an idea of exactly where to plant the asparagus so that it gets the most direct sun during the, the, the summer time in particular, because that's really the most important time for them. And so, Llama Llama, thanks so much. Yes, Mala is very cute. Um, she can be a bit mischievous at times, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. This, is our, this will be our first full growing season. Um, I got her at the end of the last season, and, and so this will be our first full growing season. And, she still has a lot to learn about the gardening. And uh, part of my plan, I think I mentioned this um, last year, um, is I'm planning on constructing an area where she likes to lie down and putting some grass and making it a nice inviting area for her so that she will learn when I'm going out and she sees me grab the shovel or whatever, the wheelbarrow, she knows that she can just go to her spot and lie down because I'm going to be out there a while. So that's kind of where I'm headed with my plan with Mala. This will be our first year to, to start working on that. So wish me luck on that. So, okay, let's see. Amy Johnson says, is it bad to direct sow everything? I don't have good luck hardening off my seedlings. This year I will direct sow and cross my fingers. Not, not bad at all. In fact, um, I've direct sown most of my garden, most of the years that I've, I've grown. So I don't, I, I direct sow my pumpkins, my squash, my cucumbers, all of my root vegetables, all of my leaf vegetables. Really, the only thing that I start from seed on a regular basis are the tomatoes and peppers. And in recent years, I've started doing some eggplants. This year, I'm doing tomatillos. And, and I'll do some other things like onions. But everything else is direct sown. And depending on where you live, you can even direct sow onion seeds and a lot of the other things that, that we will typically start indoors. So not bad at all. Buy your, your tomato plants and your pepper plants and anything else that you you can't start from seed, put those in as transplants, and then start your clock as to when they're going to be harvested. But yeah, everything else, as long as you're selecting a variety that that will have enough time in your growing season, then they'll be fine. Just you gotta know how long your season is and then select the appropriate seeds that can germinate and grow and reach harvest. and. Cross your fingers all, all you want, but I bet you'll have some really good success direct sowing as long as you're you're choosing the right kind of plant. So yeah, nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I, 
I strongly you and strongly encourage that you do that. Um, and so, so whenever you're you're buying the plants, and, and I think it's easier when we talk about like the tomatoes and the peppers. I think it's easier to to do that research, choose the variety you want. You learn a little bit about the plant, you start the seed, and now when you put it into the ground, you have a pretty good idea of how long it's going to take before you can start harvesting the tomatoes or the peppers. You don't always get that information when you buy a plant. The plant tag should tell you the days to harvest, but if it doesn't, that's the extra information that you might need to research on your own, just to be sure. Because in my early days of gardening, I bought some tomato plants from the big box stores and didn't know that like brandy wine, for instance, brandy wine is a nice big heirloom tomato, but it just takes too long to reach maturity in my area. And so I think I think I've tried to grow brandy wine tomatoes maybe three times. And in those three years, I can only remember harvesting one maybe two tomatoes off of those plants because they just don't match with my garden and climate. And that's why I say it's important that you choose the right varieties. But if you've done that little bit of research, if you understand what your plants are, the, another big part of planning your harvest is thinking why and how you're going to, to use the plant. And so using peppers as an, an example, we go to the store, we see the green jalapenos, we see the green peppers, and many of us think that that's normal, that, that you grow peppers and they're going to be green. All peppers will be green in the beginning of the fruit process. Well, all peppers will also change color. And so I keep my jalapenos on the plant until they turn red. I'll harvest some when they're green, but I like the, the richer flavor and the color of a red jalapeno. So as you, as you plan your garden and the plants you're going to grow, anticipate what you're harvesting and what you're seeking in your harvest. I know a lot of gardeners who harvest green tomatoes because they like fried green tomatoes. If you're growing tomatoes for the purpose of harvesting when they're green, that's great. That's part of your plan for the harvest. If you want the, the rich, colored, tasty, tasteful tomato at its peak, that's different. And so it, it varies by the fruit, but that's, that's also part of your, your plan is understanding. You've got to learn what is ripe, what it is you're looking for. Most tomatoes, you can just grab the fruit and give it a very light squeeze and it just starts to give, it's a little bit soft, it's ready to harvest. Because as we grow different tomatoes, as you, as you grow a black cram or an, an orange Kellogg's breakfast or uh, a Brad's atomic grape, some of these tomatoes we're growing are weird colors. And so you can't necessarily expect that you will recognize when the fruit is ripe based on the color. You have to, to learn as part of your planning what it is you're looking for to determine when that fruit is ripe. And it may be the texture. There's a lot of melons and that, that are hard to tell when they're ripe. One way to tell if a melon is, is getting ready to harvest is to look at the tendril. Look, look at where it's actually connected to the, the, the stalk, the stem of the, 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 the stem of the plant, the stalk of the plant, that little tendril that connects the melon, when it begins to brown and dry, that's usually an indication that it's shut off from the plant now and there will be no more maturing of it. So those kind of things, understanding what to look for for each individual plant should be part of your planning from the very beginning. And if you haven't done it yet, as the plant approaches maturity and those fruits look like they might be ripe, well then do that extra little bit of research to determine for sure if it is. I love growing peppers because it's, it's a color change, quite simply. 
changes color, it tells you it's now reached maturity and you can begin harvesting it. A lot of other plants will tell you potatoes, for instance, when the potato flowers, it's telling you that those tubers have developed underground. So as soon as a potato plant flowers, you can harvest the potatoes at any point. They're going to be very small right after flowering. And the longer you keep it in the ground, those tubers will, will grow bigger. But learning to recognize and understand what you're seeing with your plant can make a huge difference because most plants will tell you when it's time to harvest. Carrots will begin to pop their shoulders above the soil surface. And you can see the size of your carrot because you can actually see the top of the carrot emerging from the soil. Look for those kind of things and, and make a point this year, if you don't know some of those, start looking for those kind of indications, those tips that the plants are giving you as you proceed through the season. And, and that's a, a, a great way to approach it. The cool season plants, spinach is a great example of this. You can harvest spinach for months and months, but as soon as it bolts, as soon as it sends up that flower stalk, the flavor of the spinach changes. You can still harvest it, you can still eat it, but it's not the same sweet leaf flavor that was there when the weather was cooler. And so those kind of things to anticipate as you put the seed in the ground can make a big difference and and eat a spinach plant that's gone to that's bolted and you'll see what i'm talking about i i, I remember before i understood how some of this worked some of those plants that i would grow for the leaves and they would bolt and i didn't understand why they tasted so bad and it, it's purely the plant telling you that it's in a different phase of its life and when you understand that that can really influence how you garden and how you approach gardening. So Jonas Salk, nice to see you. Thank you so much for that contribution. Just got my passion fruit. Awesome. Here in Virginia. Can't wait to put it in the ground. Good for you. I, I, I would love to grow passion fruit and maybe someday I will. I just ordered a couple fig trees from Baker Creek and I'm planning on growing. It's a hardy fig. It's a Chicago fig. And so I'm actually going to plant those in my greenhouse, hoping that I can grow a, a, a fruit like that. I can't get away with passion fruit yet, but uh, I'm a bit envious and uh, hope they work out well for you in Virginia. That's fantastic. There's There are a lot of those kind of fruits, the, the tropical fruits, subtropical fruits, I would love to be able to grow, but in the mountains of Colorado, it's just not going to happen. So. Virginia, make it happen. Marsha Davenport, thank you for that donation as well. I really appreciate it. And Lisa Potter, thanks for the super sticker. You guys are, are wonderful today. I really appreciate that. Always nice to, to see that and know that, that you're here. Florence Lindsay with another wonderful super sticker. Thank you, Florence. I, had, I appreciate it. It's uh, You guys are just such a fantastic crowd. I, I say this every week because I just can't avoid saying it. But I just love the time we can get together on Mondays and talk gardening and all the rest that, that we talk about. LC Dubsy, all my overwintered kale just bolted. I've read that it's not so bad to eat if you harvest it early enough and even the flowers aren't so bad. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, and kale, kale, many kales tend to have a bitter flavor to start with. And so it's not as recognizable when it bolts. But absolutely. In fact, uh, when you when you look at a lot of these plants, you know, talking about eating the the greens of the beetroot or the turnips, the flowers of of most of these plants are edible as well. That's a whole another arena, and it's on my list of videos to do someday. But to talk about all the edible flowers in the garden and how you can use them, and so that. Add that to your list of things to learn about the edible flowers. You, you may have, have seen there's some, um, there's a lot of restaurants now, Mexican restaurants in particular, that will sell a dish during the early summer, usually if they have a, a source for it, where they'll use squash flowers and they'll stuff 
the squash flowers with a, a tasty rice and maybe some meat mixed in with it. So, uh, yeah, don't overlook the idea of using flowers in your garden. Um, do that little bit of research ahead of time just to make sure that they are indeed edible. But most of them will be. And uh, and and so, yeah, kale, kale falls into that category. Go ahead and eat some flowers and use the, the leaves the, the most or the best you can. And absolutely nothing wrong with that. Okay, let's see, as we are rolling closer to the end, Greg Daner, great chat this morning, good day to all, good day to you, Greg, thanks, glad I can help out, and and like I say, I just love the chat, the, you know, it's it's these ideas, and, and you know me, I'm always trying to, to, to help you, and help you think about the future, and what you're, what you're going to do, and that's why I wanted to talk about harvests, here in early spring for many of us who don't even have plants in the ground yet because i just had so many plants that didn't make it or or, or i should say i didn't make it to harvest or i didn't get the harvest i was hoping for because i didn't understand what i was looking for with the harvest and and this also and i wanted to to add this to the conversation as well impacts what fertilizers you use because if you're growing a plant like a root crop a carrot a turnip a beet a parsnip a rutabaga if you're using a high nitrogen fertilizer then you're probably not going to get a very big root because that fertilizer is going to promote leaf growth it's going to make the plant really nice and big and it is at the expense of the root because the root doesn't need to grow nice and big if you're giving the plant the nitrogen fertilizer it needs. And I, I would say as root crops grow, carrots are the, the question I get most often at the end of the season. Why didn't I get the big carrots? Why were my carrots small and spindly? And it could be the type of fertilizer you were using. The same with tomatoes. If you have big, bushy, beautiful green tomato plants and you're not getting the fruit, well, take a look at how you fertilize. If you used high nitrogen fertilizers around your tomato plants, you told the plant that you want it to grow as big as possible. And it will do that at the expense of flowers and fruit. So anticipate how you're going to fertilize throughout the rest of the season with that harvest in mind and trying to learn the, about the correlation between the nutrients you're supplying the plant and how that's going to affect the growth of the plant. And and big reason why I don't use a lot of fertilizer and I use as little fertilizer as possible because it can be used incorrectly and not give you the results you're looking for. I primarily use my fertilizer to benefit my soil and then the plant will grow as as a, as it's intended to grow because the soil has all the nutrients it needs as opposed to fertilizing your plant and then you might not get what you're looking for based on the fertilizer that you're using so so keep that in mind and so shandy's garden says i have a garage full of hundreds of seedlings they're just stalling at their second set of true leaves I'm using weakened fertilizer. I potted them up. Suggestions. I think I overloved them. You may have overloved them. Um, have a little bit of patience. It's not unusual, depending on the plant, for it to stall, uh, it, especially if you're overwatering, if you're over fertilizing, if if you're overdoing it, the plant might stall. So, uh, if you're using a potting soil that already has fertilizer in it, and you add more fertilizer that can stunt some plants it's it may be burning the roots you've heard of fertilizer burn it basically just means that it's too intense of a chemical a nutrient chemical and the the roots are are not growing through that soil to promote the growth of the plant keep watering some of it will leach out i would say stop fertilizing stop loving your plants and then see if they recover. But yeah, it may be that you you just overlove them to a point. And so 
Um, I, I have some exciting uh, days ahead this week. I have my, my fruit trees. I just got a box yesterday. I'm expecting another one on Wednesday or Thursday. And so I ordered some more fruit trees. I ordered some more fruit bushes. And this is the week that they're supposed to be arriving. And the weather's going to be fantastic to get out there and plant these trees. And so I, I love this. I love having my seedlings appear. I love growing everything. I love putting the plants out in the garden. And I love getting the plants in the mail or going to the nursery and buying a new tree or a new bush. And I try to do it every single year. And one of the reasons I do it every single year is because it's so enjoyable. And I, I want to leave you with the method, the message today to take your time with gardening. I love getting new plants and putting them outside, trying to figure out where they're going to fit. I have my garden plan that I developed a few years ago, and I know where I'm planning to put a lot of these plants. But like like most of you, if I go to the store and I see something I just can't resist, I'll buy it and then figure out a place to put it. Even though it doesn't fit with the plan, I just see a cool plant and it's something that I want in my landscape or in my garden. I like that aspect of gardening. You can plan everything out, build the garden, plant the garden in the very first year, and then enjoy it from that point on. Enjoying the plants that are already growing, enjoying what you already did. I love what I'm going to do. And so that's why I'm suggesting plan for a future of gardening where every year you're going to add something new. Every year it might be a new bed, a new tree, a new sitting area, a new bench. Who knows? That's for you to figure out. But if every year you add something new, then that keeps the wonder of gardening alive. It keeps you growing in your garden because you're always looking for that something new. There's nothing wrong with building it and enjoying it, but but think about that aspect of it, of, of just always adding more and gardening for the long term. Gardening to, to, to lengthen the amount of time that you're in your garden doing some of these new things and to take your time. I'm on a five-year plan, and, and I'm coming along pretty well. This will be the third year of my five-year plan. I'm building more structures. I'm adding more trees. I'm adding a lot this year. I did that last year. I did that the year before, and I'll be doing it again next year because I like that aspect of gardening. You might not like it as much. That's fine. Build your beds, grow in your beds, and, and you're happy because the stress of building a garden is over. But for those of us that are just starting out, or for those of us that have recognized for years that this is an aspect of gardening that we absolutely love, then do that. If you, if you love growing tomatoes, grow tomatoes. If you love growing carrots, grow carrots. If you love adding a new tree each year, then add a new tree each year. It all comes down to what you're looking for with your gardening. And the, 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 the design and the plan and the build, that's really one of the things that I really like doing. And so uh, I, I actually haven't had anyone ask this lately, but that's why my garden hasn't been built yet. I could have spent the first year with a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort putting in all of the beds and all of the trees and all of the things that are in my garden plan. But I drew out that five-year plan and this year I'm adding blackberries. I could have done that last year, but last year I focused on finishing my raspberry bed. So I have three different types of raspberries in my raspberry bed. I completed that last year. This year, I'll focus on blackberries, and I've already got two different types of blackberries ordered. I've got the bed ready to go, and I'll be growing blackberries. In addition to jostaberries, jostaberries are a new crop. 
that I haven't grown yet, I'm putting those in the garden for the first time this year. That's what I'm talking about. Do something new. Do something that may be part of your plan, but you didn't do it last year, do it this year, or do it next year. But take your time with it, enjoy it, and then try to figure out what's the best way for you to keep advancing and keep on this journey of gardening because I just love the journey and that's the that's the piece that keeps me getting up in the morning and getting outside and staying active. Patricia Barr, thank you so much for that donation. Thank you Gardener Scott mods and participants. Absolutely. Thank thank all of you, especially the the mods and everybody that is it, it, making this such a a wonderful environment. John Jude is saying now six apple trees and five was enough until we had a chance for our favorite Jonathan for pies was found for sale. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. You, you plan for five apple trees. You're happy with five apple trees. And then there's a variety that, that you hadn't planned on, but you came across and you're adding it. I love that. Thank you for, for sharing that. It's one of those things that definitely keeps us all going as Terry Hall is saying now. So I hope you have a great gardening week. I hope it's everything you are looking for. And I hope you can start thinking about not only what you're going to be harvesting this year, think about it now, but especially for for those of us like, like Rick Thalian, who is getting toward the end of the gardening season, what are you going to be doing next year? And I think we should always be looking ahead, always mapping out our path on this journey. And I enjoy it. I know you enjoy it and keep having fun with it. Enjoy the gardening. I'm Gardener Scott. We'll see you next week.